as we get into our study today, I'm calling this um, teaching, You Don't Know Me. You Don't Know Me. How many of you guys ever said that or heard that or felt that way when someone kind of judges you or says something about you? You, know, you don't know me. You don't know what I've done or what I've been through. Or, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. But today in this text, Jesus says to some Pharisees, essentially, you don't know me. You don't know me. See, here's the thing is a lot of people think, and we talked about this the last week or even a couple weeks, but oftentimes we think just because we're close to Jesus, proximity, right? We're in the same room as Jesus, right? A Pharisee could say, yeah, I know Jesus. I've heard him teach in the temple. It's all this blasphemous type of teaching, whatever they might say, right? And they'd say, yeah, I know Jesus. But proximity to Jesus doesn't equal a close relationship with Jesus. And again, today, Jesus is in, he's teaching Pharisees come in. The Pharisees are religious leaders. If you're not familiar with the Bible, when you see Pharisees or the, the Sanhedrin, the scribes, um, these people, they're religious leaders. And what you could think of today, what we would associate them with is church people, church leaders, pastors, right? And so you might think like, oh, the Pharisees, they know it all, right? So if they say something, that's, the, that's kind of the heartbreaking thing is that the Pharisees were supposed to be leading people to God. That would be part of their job. But they got so prideful and arrogant that they almost thought that they were many gods in a sense. And then they missed the Messiah, the one that they proclaimed that, hey, we're waiting for the Messiah, the one who's to come. And Jesus is like, hey, I'm him. And they're like, no, you're not, man. Like, we know where you're from. But again, Jesus today in the text, he says, you don't know me. You think you know me, but you don't know me. And maybe that's something we think about today. When we come in here, we have our own ideas, our own thoughts of like, yeah, I know Jesus. I'm good with Jesus. Um, here's a question is, are, are you really good with Jesus? Do you really know him? In Matthew, I think it's chapter seven, um, could be chapter six, Sermon on the Mount though. Jesus says that in the last days or, you know, essentially when we die, many people are going to come to him and say, Lord, Lord, you know, and what's he going to say to them? For those of you who know. Depart from me, for I never knew you. Right? It's like we're going to get to the, the gates, right? Thinking like, oh, yeah, like this is it. It's everything I've been waiting for. We get to the door, and Jesus is like, hey, who are you? And you're like, oh, man, Lord, like I'm Nick. I'm your servant. And he's like, depart from me. I never knew you. Those are some scary words, and that's something to think about. It's not a story like, oh, that's a good story with some good morals and things that we could apply to our life and try to be better people. Like that's the truth of what will happen one day. So sometimes we can think like, oh, yeah, we're good with Jesus. I got, I've gone to church before. I know a little bit about him. But do you know him? Right? Like, do you know him? Like, a good idea of this, you know, if you like sports. Anybody like sports? Right? We're in Texas. I mean, it's almost like you have to like sports to some degree, I guess. But sports, right? Some people, you might know all the things. One of my best friends, two of them, actually, they're sports like gurus they know everything it's kind of weird and creepy right like literally like oh yeah that guy's high school stats i'm like how do you know this guy's high school stats and then they're like oh yeah he's this tall he can run a 40 and this much his vertical is this much. like he's in college i'm like this is weird and creepy like you're you're creeping on 19 year old boys 20 you know anyways if that's you and you like that that's whatever like you like sports but you know a lot about them but do you know them you don't know anything about them Right, like a, an artist, your favorite musician, you might be like, oh, they're awesome, and I love their music. You know a lot about them, like their music, but do you know them? No. Right, and so same thing with Jesus. Like, hey, oftentimes we can think like, oh, yeah, I know a lot about Jesus, but do you know Jesus? All right, and so in today's text, it's pretty hardcore. Again, if you remember last week, we looked at the woman caught in adultery. It's almost as if... Um, if you're here the last couple weeks, um, the Feast of Booths is happening. Uh, what you need to know about that, really, they're remembering the days of the Exodus movement, right? The Exodus is Old Testament. There's Genesis, the book of Genesis. Then there's the book of Exodus, which records the Exodus, the movement of when they're freed from slavery from Egypt, right? The Israel people, the Israelites, and then they're going through the wilderness. And so then God says, you know, remember these things, have this Feast of Booths, which is essentially... They would have like tents and they would sleep in tents to remember their wandering in the wilderness because they actually literally lived in tents when they were going around camping essentially for 40 years. But it, was, uh, it would be a week long or so 
feast, and then they would remember some pretty um, significant things, right? They would remember that God provided for them in the wilderness, that he literally rained down manna or bread from heaven. Um, How crazy would that be? Um, That'd be pretty incredible. But like one of those things where God's like, hey, remember these things. And I don't know, to us, we'd be like, well, that'd be hard to forget. But if you look through the Bible, the Israel, the Israelites, they often forget. They're kind of rebuke that God speaks to them over and over and over again over the the centuries. Is like remember, remember these things, and He's always bringing them back to these little things. And so the Feast of Booths here in Jesus' day, this is a long time after. Um, they they would be setting up tents. They'd be remembering the manna that would come down from heaven. And if you remember, a couple weeks ago, Jesus is in the temple during the Feast of Booths, and he has this um, teaching that's like so controversial and so crazy because he says something that's, that would hit super hard, and he says that I am the bread of life. Right? When they're remembering the manna from heaven, right, and they're having this whole celebration of remembering what happened hundreds of years ago, and Jesus comes in, he takes the, the pulpit or whatever, you know, and he's like, hey, come to me, I am the bread of life. Right? That would be some pretty controversial things in that day and age. But what Jesus was doing, he's making a statement, saying, I am the sustainer. He's, I am, I'm better than the manna in, in the wilderness, right? Which would be some fighting words back then for the Jewish audience, right? But he's like, I am that. He goes on and he says this in, the, this is John chapter 7, after he says that the bread of life, he talks about how he is, um, um, rivers of living water would come out of him, right? And or with the Holy Spirit. And so that would be some controversial stuff during the Feast of Booths. They're not only remembering the manna, from heaven, they'd be remembering when things like when Moses struck the rock and all of a sudden water was provided for them or there was bitter water and God said throw a stick in there and then all of a sudden the bitter water becomes good water that you can drink. They would be remembering God's provision and Jesus like, hey, I am the bread of life. I am the living water. And today, it's like we pick up in this little um, series of Jesus teaching here during the Feast of Booths and today he says that I am the light of the world. Right, and you probably heard that before, right? And maybe, but what you probably haven't heard, maybe you have, or if you do your Bible study, again, trying to know Jesus a little more, this is during the Feast of Booths, and like where they're remembering the Exodus, and there was something super, there's a lot of super um, specific, important details to the, the Exodus, but they were led at one time by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Like, talk about crazy. Like God's like, hey, follow me. You're like, well, where did I go? He's like, well, just follow that big thing of fire. You're like, you know, like that's pretty obvious. Like, that'd be pretty. Cre- I want to see these things again. I've told you this the last few weeks. Like, I want to see this on replay when we get to heaven. Like, Lord, let me see. What does this pillar of fire look like? Was it just like a little thing that we could be like, hey, you know, maybe that's just someone burned fire in the wilderness. Um, but it'd be these am- amazing things. And so the pillar of fire is this light. And so during the Feast of Booths, these people, they would actually, some people think that it's every single night that the men, they would get these fires, torches, and they'd be dancing around. Then it'd be a symbol of the pillar of light that they're remembering God's provision that he not only provided for them, but he guided them through the wilderness. These are important things. And so for this Jewish audience here in the temple, this is like... um, I mean, it's pretty heartfelt, but then Jesus comes in, he says, I'm the bread of life, I'm the living water, and today he says, I am the light of the world. So what he's saying, he's like, I am the, I'm better than the manna, I'm better than the water that they had in the wilderness um, from Moses, and he says, and I'm better than the pillar of fire, which again would be some fighting words for some Jewish people back then, but that's what he's saying, and what we noted last week, like Jesus is controversial. Um, you got to understand, Jesus will offend each and every one of us. The gospel will offend each and every one of us. Why? Because we're sinners and we need salvation. And so if you hear the gospel at some point, you're like, you know what? That's not very offensive. Like I would argue that maybe you didn't hear the full gospel. Right? We are all sinners in need of salvation. Jesus will offend each and every one of us at some point in our life, if not often, right? Because Jesus isn't cool with your sin. You think like, oh, it's okay, nobody cares about what I'm doing, Um, my wife's cool with it, my friends are cool with it, my work's cool with it, you know, the state is cool with it, the the law, governments, but here's the thing, it doesn't matter if it's legal, like here in the United States, like, 
God's word is God's word. And if it's a sin against God, you can legalize sin here. You know, I'm talking about like constitutionally. I don't know if that's the right word. Politically, who knows? Um, that doesn't mean that's okay. So like you, you're going to have sin and God's going to keep working on you. That's part of the whole thing. Like at first when you come to Jesus, like usually it's a lot, right? It's like, yeah, I am a sinner. I got all these big, huge things going on. And you got, you got to repent from, from them. You turn from your sin that you could follow Jesus. And that's part of the first steps. And then, you know, years later, maybe decades later, you think like, well, I'm doing pretty good now. I'm not getting drunk. I'm not so angry anymore. I don't curse anybody out. Or, you know, these are things that probably some people do. Um, not you guys, because you're um, sanctified and holy. Uh, but, you know, we, we keep working, but then God's going to keep working things out. There might be some bitterness that happens in our heart, right? Or there's like anger, but we're not vocally angry, but inner, inwardly we're angry towards people. And so Jesus is always working on us, and Jesus will offend us oftentimes because we are sinful. Um, and Jesus doesn't offend us because he hates us. Or he's trying to condemn you. We've been over this too. Jesus came so that we could be saved, right? When he has all these controversial teachings in the temple, I just I wish we could kind of have again a, a snapshot, a peek in the window here of what's going on. But like there'd probably be so much anger and hatred towards Jesus when he's teaching this in the temple this day and age. But here's the heart of Jesus. They miss the heart of Jesus. They think they know Jesus, but they miss it all. His heart is that he wants them to be saved, each and every person. And how crazy is it that you could be so close, like we said a few weeks ago, but so far from, from Jesus. And so let's look at the text today. John chapter 8, verse 12 says, Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Again, this is some controversial, cutting-edge things, breaking news. Jesus in the temple, on the Feast of Booze, saying he is the light of the world, right? That's like trend, trending on Twitter type of stuff right there. Right? I am the light of the world. He says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. If you remember, this is a long time ago, but John chapter 1, it talks about that he is the, the true light, that he is the light of men. That all of us who receive him, right, he gives the ability to be, become um, children of God. So he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, you need to understand this, to know Jesus, to believe in Jesus, to like you're actually a disciple of Jesus, means to follow Jesus. He says, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me, does that mean whoever's a fan of me? Right, like oftentimes, like we're we again going to the sports illustration, right? Where we're like, yeah, I know them, all this things. Like we're a fan of sports. Jesus doesn't want fans who are like, yeah, I know a lot about him. Let's go, Jesus. Right? He wants followers. He wants people on his team, playing with him, battling the darkness. Right? He says, whoever follows me. That's an active word that we would actually do something. So maybe something to think about today when you're like, hey, do I know Jesus? Am I actually following Jesus? Well, take a look at your life. I think you could answer this probably pretty easily. Are you following Jesus or not? Like, what does that mean? Are you living like Jesus? Do you forgive like Jesus? When someone at work, they wrong you, they upset you, do you forgive them? Say, hey, it's okay, man. Like, don't worry about it, right? Like, I forgive you if they say sorry. Or even if they don't say sorry, right? You forgive them anyways. You let it go. Right? You turn the other cheek. Do you live like Jesus? That's what it means to follow Jesus to live like Jesus. Whoever follows me, he says, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And I love this because, man, before we meet Jesus, we're walking in darkness, aren't we? Maybe some of you today, you've never met Jesus, and you know this is the offensive word right here, is that you're walking in darkness. And you'd be like, no, I'm not. I know what I'm doing. I know where I'm going. But you think you know. You're living for yourself. But that's living in darkness. right? And for me, a lot of, early on, young adult, college years, right, I was walking in darkness. Thought I knew what I was doing. I was a man, right? I'm 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. I can do whatever I want. And I know what, you know, I felt like I knew something. Only now that I'm 35, I look back, I was like, man, I, was, I didn't know much. Um, I pro do we all feel that way or just me? Uh, but when you're 18, you're like, I'm a man. Uh, don't tell me what to do, mom. I'm going to get my own place and move out and explore the world. But anyways, I was walking in darkness, though, 
or I was tripping up over little things that would just trip me up. And the thing is, you don't realize it's tripping you up until you come to meet Jesus and he turns the lights on, right? And it's like, it's you're stumbling over little things, right? Your friends, that was a big one for me. It's like my friends were stumbling and tripping me up, but I thought I was all good. But then Jesus turns the lights on. I'm like, oh man, I need new friends. Not because they weren't, like I loved my friends. I still see them and talk to them when I go back to Tucson. I love them, but it's like Jesus, like you need a new group of friends, man. They're stumbling you. They're tripping you up. They're holding you back. And then when we're following Jesus, he says very clearly here, whoever follows me, you're not going to walk in darkness anymore, but you're going to have the light of life. You're going to see things with clearer vision, right? God's word in Psalm 119, he says that his word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, right? Like in John 1, it says that in the beginning, the word was with God, the word was God, and And so the word is Jesus. The word is the light. So Jesus right here is like, he's like, I'm the light of the world. Anyone who comes and follows me, you're not going to walk in darkness, but you'll have the light of life. How do we have that light of life? How do we know Jesus? Like I said, starting out, you know Jesus by knowing, spending time in his word. Doesn't mean you're memorizing all these things and just in one ear, out the other. Yeah, I can quote John 3.16 and all these verses all day. You know, it's like, but do you know Jesus? Sitting down, like considering the text. Like for me, there's times where you just got to sit down, pause, right? Slow summer where it's like, hey, just take four verses, maybe one verse even. And you just say, Lord, help me understand this. Something that you're like, man, there's something here. I don't know what it is. Don't skip over it. Just, Lord, help me understand this. Take a moment before the Lord. Get to a quiet space, right? Maybe it's your bedroom. Maybe you have an office, whatever, right? Kneel down, pray. Ask God to come meet you right here, right, right then and there, and give you understanding. The crazy thing is, is he will oftentimes do that, right? He brings the light because he is the light. And so he's saying this to all these religious leaders. There's also other people there. It's not just religious leaders. There'd be Jewish men and probably even Jewish women are there as well. And he says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but you will have the light of life. Verse 13, so the Pharisees, again, these are like the church people, the church leaders of that day. At least that's how they would be perceived to the public. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself, your testimony is not true. So they've, they're always trying to trip Jesus up. They're always trying to find something. They're, they're just so legalistic, right? They're looking for anything to hold against them, kind of like, you know, the lawyers and stuff going on. I won't even get into it today, but if you watch the news, you know what I'm talking about. Like, they'll try and for anything that they can grasp. The Pharisees, like any little thing that Jesus says or does, they're going to ridicule it. They're going to try to pull it apart, right? You're bearing witness about yourself. Therefore, your witness isn't true, which... On one hand, yeah, it makes sense. If you're looking at things from a fleshly, earthly, in a sense, logical perspective, sure, that makes sense, right? If I'm like, hey, I'm the best baseball player there ever was, right? It's like, that's, I could say whatever I want, but like, that doesn't mean anything, right? But if someone else comes up here and says like, hey, Nick's the best baseball player there ever was, you might think like, well, maybe he actually is, right? Because there's power in a witness account. And so Jesus is testifying about himself. They think they got him on, on the hook here, right? You're, you're bearing witness. It's not true, right? They're trying to disqualify that. Like, hey, let's just dispel that myth. Jesus answers them, verse 14, even if I do bear witness about myself, my witness or my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where, am I, where I am going, but you do not know where I came, come from or where I am going. Right, and so Jesus answers here, even if I do bear witness about myself, it's still true. And Jesus is the, like the only person who can really say that because he literally knows everything. Right? He's like, literally, I can bear witness about myself and anything because I've been here the entire time. Like literally, when the earth was created, I could tell you all about it because you know what? I created it. Right? He could tell us all these things in the first. He'd be like, oh, who are you to bear witness about yourself? Right? And Jesus like, I don't know. It's just like... God is loving. He's so nice. Jesus is so nice to them. I'm like, man, I'm glad I wasn't there. Anything, I'd get a little upset, kicked out of the temple. Um, you know what I mean? They're like, you get upset. But Jesus is like, hey, even if I do bear witness about myself, it's still true. Because Jesus speaks true things. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. There is no other. 
So whatever Jesus says, whatever he testifies to, whatever he's bearing witness about, it's a true account. The Pharisees, though, they don't know Jesus. That's the problem. Right? If they knew who he was, they'd believe him. But they're looking at things from a, a fleshly, human perspective. And might I even say sinful perspective? And they're like, hey, you know, in a logical sense, you can't bear witness about yourself because that just it doesn't have credibility. And maybe that's true, but Jesus is like, hey, it doesn't matter. Like, even if I didn't bear witness or whatever, still true. He's like, I know where I came from. I came from heaven. Right? That's where he was before he became a man on earth. When John chapter 1, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's where he was. He's out there creating things, right? We don't even, we can't understand that. He's like, I know where I came from. He's also alluding, we'll see this as weeks progress. He's alluding that I came from the Father, which these people would be all about the Father, right? Father, Father God, right? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're all about it. That's probably how they prayed every day, you know, in the temple. Like, oh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Father God, all these things. That's a good thing, but Jesus will soon show, like, you don't know the Father. You don't know me. You don't know him. You don't know what you're talking about. That's really what he's saying. It's crazy because these guys have committed their lives to this. Like, what are you talking about, Jesus? Like, I've been studying this since I was a child. Right? I learned the Torah when I was seven. Back to front, all these things, I could quote it all to you. By the time I was 10, 11, 12, 13, I learned the whole Old Testament. What are you talking about, Jesus? We know what we're, who we are, right? But Jesus is like, you don't know. You don't know me. You don't know the Father. You don't know really anything. He says he knows where he's going. He goes on, he says, you judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. When we talk about this verse, it'd be easy to say, you know, Jesus doesn't judge anyone, and so don't judge me. And I think there is an element, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, where we shouldn't judge essentially one another, but there is a part where we do hold each other accountable, right? And so when you hold each other accountable, and you're like, hey man, what's going on? I had a best friend, um, you know, we got wings one night, and we're watching NBA playoffs, you know, and he's like, Nick, like, you know, he calls me out on my sin. When are you going to stop doing this stuff? Um, and it was him, like, holding me accountable, right? I could have got angry and upset. Don't judge me. Jesus said, don't judge. But, like, I received it because I knew it was true. I'm like, I do need to change, and I am in sin, and I, I know what I need to do. Um, so there is that element. When someone asks something about you, it's not because they hate you. Not because they're trying to condemn you. It's like, hey, like, how are you doing in your life? Let's start working towards following Jesus more closely. And that's a good thing. But here, he says that you judge according to the flesh. So their judgment might be true in a, a Jewish courtroom, but they're not judging according to the Spirit. They're not judging according to things of God. And that's what he's saying. And when Jesus says, I judge no one, he's essentially saying, I judge no one according to the flesh. He judge, judges according to the Spirit, because we'll see here in a minute. He says this, verse um, 16, Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I am the Father who sent me. All right? And if you know anything about Jesus and God's Word, we know that Jesus will judge us. Like There's going to be a day where we face Jesus, we face judgment. Now the thing is... Um, if you know Jesus truly, not just know about him, like you know Jesus, you have a relationship with him. When we get to, to the gates, however this goes down one day, when we get there, you know, he, we will know him. And Jesus is going to, it says that if we, what does Jesus say? He says, if we testify um, him before men, he's going to, um, what's the word? Someone said it? No, I don't know. I thought I heard someone say it. But he's going to represent us before the Father, right? So there's this idea when we come to Jesus, when we die, we go to heaven, right? Jesus is like, hey, like the Father, God, the Trinity, right? You know, the Father is like, hey, who's this? Jesus is like, hey, don't worry. His sin is on my tab, right? Like he knows me. He's with me. And let me just tell you, you want to be with Jesus, right? Like you want to be with Jesus. Otherwise, you're going to hear like, hey, I never knew you. And that, that scripture from Matthew chapter 7, I believe, when Jesus says, people are going to come to me on that day, say, Lord, Lord, like, we cast out demons in your name. We did all these works in your name, right? And then Jesus says, I never knew you. So you can do a lot of good things, but if you don't know Jesus, it doesn't matter. 
And so, like, here he's like, but, and we know he says, he's like, I don't judge according to the flesh, but we do know he will judge one day because he is a just God. And he gives us a, an option. You can either take his, his plea bargain, which is, you know, eternal life, which is amazing, or you can pay for your own sins, which means eternal punishment in hell apart from God for eternity. Right? And so he will judge one day. But here and now, when he's there in the flesh, right, he's like, I'm, I'm, he's here to, to love people, to set them free. But one day he's going to come back as, as judge. He says, even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it's not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. And so now he's saying some more pretty hardcore things. And if you're a Jewish audience, then this would, again, ruffle some feathers. This would be controversial. He says, I and the Father. You're like, wait a second. Like, Father God, he's like, yeah, Father God, me and the Father, we're one. Like, my judgment is his judgment, his judgment is mine. That's how close we are. They'd be like, you're, you know what I mean? Like, you hear what I'm saying? Does this make sense? You've seen the picture? Like, they're just probably, I don't know, getting super fired up um, of what he's saying. Because Jesus is saying, I, I'm God, me and the Father, we're one. We're the same. This is, this is, uh, some crazy stuff he's saying, but it's the truth. Verse 17, he says, In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. And so Jesus is going to appeal to their logic, right? Okay, you say my, my testimony is not true, but let's talk about it, right? It says, In your law, it's written, but the testimony of two people is true. He says, I am the one who bears witness about myself. And he says, And the Father who sent me bears witness about me. Right? And again, this is pretty hardcore stuff, but if you know what has happened in Jesus' life here on earth, in the flesh, right? there was a moment when John the Baptist baptized Jesus, and what happened? The Father in heaven says, this is my Son, um, in whom I'm well pleased. Like, listen to Him, essentially. Father God, bearing witness about Him. If you fast or rewind, this is a while back, but I think it's John chapter 5, Jesus had a similar argument, right? Like you're bearing witness about yourself. And he says, even if I don't bear witness about myself, he's like, the works, the very works, the things that I do bear witness about me. Right? If you were to watch Jesus and you're like, you know what? Let's see if he is who he says he is. And he goes over to a guy who can't walk. And the next thing you know, the guy's healed and he's walking. And you're like, well, that's kind of hard to argue with. Either it was set up beforehand or he is who he says he was. Right? It's like, and then there's multiple accounts. We'll see them as we, in chapter 9, as we go through John, where he heals a blind man, a guy who couldn't see his whole life, and all of a sudden, boom, he can see. Right? Because that's what Jesus does. He does miracles. He is God in the flesh here. And so he's like, even if I don't bear witness about myself, look at the things that I do. Even if I don't bear witness about myself, the Father, and he's saying, he's saying like, the Father you think that you believe in, he bears witness about me. And so he's saying some hardcore things. And they said to him, therefore, where is your father? Are you talking about this father? Who is your father? Who is, who is your dad? Right? And this was probably a jab at Jesus in one way, because they probably thought they knew Jesus. Oh, we know who your father is. Right? It's your, your half-dad, right? Your mom was a virgin, and she had a baby, and nobody, you don't know who your dad is, right? That's probably like some kind of jab that they're trying to make at Jesus, because they don't, they don't know him. Who is your dad? Right? Joseph was his dad, but not like his biological dad, right? You know the story. Um, so they're probably trying to, to belittle him, embarrass him, or who knows what. But Jesus answered them. He says, you know neither me nor my father, right? You, you don't know me. You don't know my father. The thing is, like, you think you know the father, but the one that you think you know is, my, is, is the father. You know what I'm saying? This is co complicated, isn't it? He says, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So Jesus is there in the temple preaching these things, and this is hardcore, this is controversial, this is ruffling up some feathers, but man, people are still there, and we'll see at the end of this section today, is that many believed in him. All right, even though the Pharisees, the religious leaders are like, this guy's crazy, let's just keep finding ways to try to trick him, trap him, arrest him, get rid of him, right? There's still people who are like, but I think he is who he says he is, 
right? Because nobody does things like he does. Nobody speaks like he speaks. But he goes on, verse 21. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me. Check this out. He says, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. For me, in my Bible, I highlight that you will die in your sins, right? He's speaking to the Pharisees, but maybe this is a word for you to consider for yourself today, right? Jesus is like, hey, where I'm going, you cannot come and you will die in your sins. Why is he saying this? You can't come because you don't know me. It's not that you can't know me, it's that you don't. Right? He just said, like, you don't know my Father, you don't know me. If you knew the Father, you'd know me. If you knew me, you'd know the Father, but you don't know anything, you're stuck in your pride. You think you know. You think you're good. Jesus is telling them very clearly, you're not good. But he's also telling them very clearly, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me, man, I'm going to give you the ability to live, to have life, have light, the light of life. But he says, I'm going away. You will seek me, and you will die in your sins. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said... Right? They're trying to make sense of this. Will he kill himself? Since he says where I am going, you cannot come. Right? Again, this just tells us more that they don't understand Jesus. They don't know what, what's going on here. They're trying to make sense of it in the best that they could, I suppose. And he said to them, this is Jesus, he says, You are from below, the earth, the world. I'm from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. And here's the key. If you're feeling like, man, maybe there's no hope for me, there is hope. He says, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So he's confronting their sins in the temple. I love it because it's so, I don't know, just hardcore. Jesus is hardcore. Yeah. And I love hardcore God and I love hardcore music. Right? Amen? Anybody? No? All right. We got maybe one. But anyways, I just... I just love it, though. Jesus just tells the truth. He's telling them, you're, you're of the world. There's no other way around it. There's no way to sugarcoat it. You just, you don't know me. You're going to die in your sins, right? That's the truth today. Like, if you're going to share the gospel with someone who doesn't know Jesus, the truth is, you're going to die in your sins. And I know that's not very, like, welcoming, right? Like, hey, welcome to church. We want people to want to stay here and be, you know what I mean? But it's like, hey, if we really care about people, like, hey, you're going to die in your sins, meaning you're going to die because you didn't know Jesus. You're going to be sent to hell, Hades, for eternity. I don't know what that's going to look like. There's all kinds of theological debate of what it looks like. But the whole point is Jesus is like, I don't want you to go there. But if you don't know me, that's where you're headed already. Each one of us, too. Like, you're going to die in your sins. If you don't come to Jesus, we're born into this world. We're born as sinners. We have a sinful inclination. Do you guys notice this? Have you noticed this in your life? If you have little kids, too, you notice it, right? Like, you didn't teach them to lie or to anything or try to hide things and not tell the truth. They just do it naturally because there's some kind of sinfulness inside of humanity. We all need salvation. We all need Jesus. But Jesus is like, you're going to die in your sins. But he says, if, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. I just love this, man. If you believe, and believe isn't just I intellectually acknowledge that you are something special. Belief is like he said earlier, whoever follows me, belief would be something that would imply action. All right? And I just want you to understand, think about this in your own life, because, man, I hope I want each and every one of us to have a, not a just knowledge about Jesus, but to have a relationship and an active like pursuit of Jesus in our lives. So where we're trying to show Jesus to people around us in different ways. Belief is not an intellectual acknowledgement. That's good. Like we can, we want to learn things, but belief is something like I really believe Jesus and he is who he said he is and that he wants me to do what he did. Right. And like, if you really believe that, what would you do? Like, that would mean, like, man, I'm going to follow him. Like if you really believe that he says, hey, come follow me, well, then you would follow him. But many people today, especially, like, American Christian church, you can go listen to a lot of people. They're famous, and they're super, I don't know, 
charismatic and it's fun to watch, but oftentimes like they won't lead people to Jesus. They just give you a little feel-good sermon real quick, pump you up like, oh man, that was exciting. Worship was amazing. And then you're like, well, what, what's God doing in your life? You're like, I don't know, but you know, Sunday's music was on point and they had fog and smoke and all those things. Those are cool, whatever, but people are missing the whole thing of like, hey, Jesus is calling us to follow him. Jesus didn't have lights and cameras and fog and all that stuff in the temple. He's just out there Old school, they didn't have electricity back then. That's crazy, right? He's like, come follow me. Believe. Have faith. Having faith would, again, be like belief, that you have enough faith to believe Jesus is who he says he is and that he wants you to do what he did. And they, the, the argument goes on. They said to him, who are you? Right, again, just showing us that they don't know Jesus. Jesus said to them, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. Right? The message is the same. hasn't changed. Right? I've been telling you these things over and over again, but you don't want to believe. And that's the thing, too, with the world. If they don't want to believe, if you don't want to believe, there's no way we're going to talk you into it. Right? If you're going to harden your heart, God says in his word, this is Romans chapter 1, where like, when we harden our hearts, eventually he just gives us over to our sin. Right, where he's just like, fine, I'm just going to give you over to yourself. You want that? You want the world? Go get it. See how that goes, right? And it's this, uh, this um, I mean, it's really a kind of scary when God's like, he's left you to yourself. Like, that should be the frightening thing where it's like, you might think, well, oh, but I have all this freedom. I'm going to do whatever I want. God's like, fine, go see how that goes. Go taste the world. See if it has everything to offer and it's everything you dreamed of. Um, but the thing is, like Jesus' message um, they say, who are you? He says, I, I've been telling you this from the beginning. It's nothing different. He says, I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. So right at this point, we might not understand all of what he's, he'll get into it in a little bit, but at the end of chapter 8, which will be next week, he talks about the Father and he's very clear when he's like, my father is like the father in heaven, father of Abraham. He's like, your father is the devil, yeah. father of lies, which is like hardcore in the temple. It's all these worshipers and believers in the Bible, or maybe it wasn't called the Bible, but, you know, the Torah and stuff of that nature. But he says, he who sent me, the father, right, um, he is true. He says, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. It says, verse 27, they did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. So again, a very important part of this whole thing, um, kind of being in that uh, Feast of Booths week. Right? He's the bread of life. He is the living water. Right? He is the light of the world. Um, and even here he's saying this, is like when you see the Son of Man lifted up, and he's alluding to another thing that happened in Moses' day. Do you guys remember this one? Right? There was a, a thing where they're getting plagued with snakes, and they're getting bitten and dying. Um, and what happens? God gives them this like post um, with a, a snake on it. And it says, turn. Anyone who looks at it, you're going to be healed. You guys know this story? Like literally today, if you go look at a lot of like the medical centers, they had like a little post or something with a snake thing wrapped around it. Like that's literally a biblical thing. Like pretty crazy. Um, but anyways, it's like literally all they had to do is turn, look at this, this post, and they would be healed. Right? And so Jesus is alluding to this because that post, it would be lifted up where people could see. But if you're too prideful and stubborn, you're like, no, that's too easy. That's stupid. What am I going to look at a post for? Right? And then they die. Right? But that's what people do today. Like, I'm not going to give my life to Jesus. Like, that sounds too easy. All I got to do is repent of my sin and say I'm sorry and believe in Jesus. And then I'll be forgiven and have eternal life. You're like, yeah. They're like, no, that, that sounds too good to be true. I can't believe that. I don't know. People will be like that, right? They're like, that's just too simple, too easy. God, I think God does it that way because we're just too stupid. I'm like, literally, he's like, I just need to make it so easy that everybody can understand us. But we like to think we're so smart. And like, it's got to be more than that. No, like, just come to Jesus, believe in Jesus, turn to Jesus. He says, when you see the Son of Man lifted up, what he's saying, on the cross, like, he is the, the Savior of the world. He's, when you see him lifted up, then you will know that I am he. 
Right? There's something that happens, too, when Jesus is on the cross. There's several different accounts of different people. There's a Roman guard. There's other Jewish people who look and they see Jesus crucified on the cross, and they say, they, they basically, that he is who he said he is. Just as he, Jesus is saying, when you see me lifted up, and they might be thinking something else. What do you mean lifted up? Like on a stage, on a platform, like you're going to be somebody. And soon enough, these people, they would know. All right, they would see that. They would know that this guy is an innocent man. There's guys who accounts of it. They say, truly, this is the, the Son of God. Um, in that moment when he's crucified, there's the veil torn. I mean, there's all kinds of epic things happening when Jesus is crucified. And he's like, you're going to know. People would know. And they would know that I, I'm doing what the Father's told me to do. Jesus, in perfect obedience, dying on the cross. You don't do that just because you're like, hey, you know what? I don't got anything else to do on this day. On Friday, I might as well go and, and get crucified. Right? Jesus is literally in perfect obedience, doing the things the Father sent him to do. And, they're based, and he's saying, you're going to see me lifted up. You're going to see this happen. And then you're going to know that this isn't, isn't me. This is the Father's will. Uh, verse 20, 29, yeah. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. For I always do the things that are pleasing to him. So he's doing the things of the Father. And then it says, verse 30, it says, As he was saying these things, many believed in him. Many believed in him. And I just love it. It's like even though Jesus is controversial, we said this last week too, and we'll probably say it next week as well, um, just when he's in the temple, many people are arguing with him, trying to prove him wrong. They don't want to believe in him. They want to make him look foolish, silly. They try to trap him last week, bringing this woman caught in adultery. What do you want to do with her, Jesus, right? And they try to trick him and all these things. But even so, people are start, still coming to Jesus, believing in Jesus. And I just want to emphasize this. As we follow Jesus in action, we're actually doing something, pursuing him, trying to live like he lived, be like he, he was, right? Love like he loved. When we're the lights of the world, walking through this dark, dark world, um, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to want to argue with you. They're probably smart people too, you know, in a worldly sense, because they went to college and they got a degree or whatever. But um, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to also hear you and they're going to believe. And when we go out there to shine the light, there's going to be people who see it and they're going to be. We'll see this in a couple of weeks. There's a guy who was blind, and now he sees it, which is a physical picture of a spiritual reality that's like, man, I was blind, but now I see. Or when we're out there shining the light, like some people, they're just not going to see it because they are spiritually blind, but some people will. And I just want to encourage you as you go out there, don't, don't let the world beat you up. Don't let them distract you. Don't let them get you down. I'd say pray for them. Pray that God would open their eyes. And Jesus tells us that. He says, pray for those who persecute you. That's a hard one. If you're like, you know what? I don't want to pray for them who persecute you. I want to write Psalms like David crushed the teeth of my enemies. <laughs> right? All kinds of stuff. But Jesus says, pray for those who persecute you. And so maybe you pray for them. People make fun of you at work or whatever. They just don't understand you. Um, pray for them. Love them. Be Jesus. In, be the mini Jesus in their life. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, I think I quoted last week Andy Minio. He's a, a Christian rapper. Uh, but there's another song that he has there, but he talks about um, this idea, and probably many people have said this before. Um, but he was saying how when you see him out with people that you think he shouldn't be, and he's like, why am I with him? He's like, yeah, uh, I'm out there with him. Be and this doesn't rhyme. I don't know how it goes. I forget. But he says, I'm out there because my life is the only Bible that they've ever seen. Because right? a lot of the people in the world, they're not going to come to church to hear the Bible. They're not going to read the Bible for themselves. right? But we are, the, we are the light of the world. Jesus says, you're salt and light. So we're to go out there. But understand this, that you represent Jesus. And the Bible tells us this too. We're ambassadors for Christ. What's an ambassador? It's a representative, right? It's like when there's an ambassador of America in a foreign country, they're representing our country to that whatever, wherever they are, right? You are an ambassador for Jesus if you believe in him, if you follow him. So wherever you go, you're representing Jesus. Just think about that for a second, right? Wherever you go, 
with your friends, at work, at home, you're representing Jesus. And so think about it. Are you following Jesus? Are you living like Jesus? Are you pursuing Jesus? And maybe the problem is you, you can't follow him because you don't know him. It's hard to follow somebody you don't know. But here's the thing you could start today. You start simple. Lord, I don't know anything. But here I am. I want to know. I want to learn. I want to come to you. I want to believe so that I could have life. I don't want to die in my sins. I want my sins forgiven. And that's the beauty of Jesus is that he offers the same offer to every single person, every man, woman, and child. That's you come to me, your sins are forgiven. That we could have eternal, everlasting life. Amen? And so we're going to pray. And uh, this is like the shortest message ever, huh? This is good. I like this. We can have time. It's a slow summer. Um, but we're going to pray. We're going to get into communion. Um, but if you are new here, when we do communion, it's a communion. We pass it all out, but we want you to take a moment with the Lord where it's like you're taking communion as we're leading worship. Um, and uh, can we get... Okay, cool. All right. Um, just make... Sorry. Side note. Just needed to make sure we have worship set up. Um, but we're going to pass it out. And as we're um, playing a song, you're going to just take worship or communion. Man, I'm all messed up. Let's take a pause. Selah. Uh, pass out communion, and you're going to take it um, by yourself um, or with your friend, your wife, your husband, someone next to you. You can do that, but you can kneel down. You can stand up. You can get to the back of the room. Uh, we want to encourage you to take a moment with Jesus. But here's also the thing. If you're not a believer today, you haven't decided to follow Jesus, right, where we don't want you to feel like you need to just do this because everybody else is doing it. We want you to do this if you're really making a commitment today. But if you're not ready yet, just let the communion cups pass. This is, we're not going to judge you or make you feel bad or anything, but this is for us who do believe when we're remembering Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, right? And so we take it, the bread uh, on the top is a little cracker, um, represents Jesus' body that was broken for us, it represents the life he lived for us. All these things we're learning here today, he did this for us. Why would he go to the temple and be ridiculed and put under fire by the Pharisees and all these religious leaders? Well, he did it for you and me part of his job, right? But then he, he was arrested, unlawfully so, and then he was beaten. I, talk, I won't go into all of what that is, but beaten. Um, and then he was crucified. Pilate says, what do you want me to do with him? And people say, crucify him, right? And so then he goes to the cross. You guys know the story. Jesus is hung on the cross, right? He'd be pierced in his hands. That's literally nails driven through his hands, nails driven through his feet. And he did that for you and me. When we're taking the bread, we're thinking, like, what, like, thank you, Jesus. We're doing this in remembrance of him because by his wounds we're healed. So scripture tells us. When we take the juice, we're remembering his blood that was shed. His blood is what cleanses our sin, much like the Exodus. We're talking a lot about Exodus these days um, with the Feast of Booths and the things that Jesus is doing. But, like, on the Exodus, they would put the blood of the lamb on their door. And that the angel of death would pass over. But if there wasn't the blood of the lamb on the door, well, there was death that would come to that household. Right? And so when we're taking the juice, we're remembering Jesus, and it represents his blood that we're proclaiming over our life, that we're receiving into our life, that we're saying, thank you, Lord, for this, because it's by his blood that, that we're, the death passes over us, that we could have eternal life. And so take a moment as we're getting into this. Don't feel rushed. But take a moment with the Lord, pray. If you're like, hey, man, I got things I need to ask for forgiveness, we'll take a moment with the Lord before you take communion. Say, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry for my sins, and I, I recognize that I'm a sinner, but I also know I can be forgiven, and that you would come to Jesus, that you would, um, and you would just remember his sacrifice, and you, you rejoice in that fact that he loves you. Um, so take a moment. Don't feel rushed. We're going to pass out communion here. After you're done with communion, we just want to ask that you stand up and we'll close the service today, um, lifting Jesus' name on high, and we'll go out there and have a good, hopefully glorifying to Jesus week um, in pursuit. So, uh, Father, we thank you for this time that we could dive into your word. That we, we thank you that you preserved it for us to read, to study. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord, that teaches us that reveals your word to us, Lord, and that you're doing a work in our hearts and in our minds. And God, I pray that you would continue to do that work now as we shift into communion to remember you and your sacrifice, Lord. And we pray that your spirit would 
just make us alive, that we would recognize, Lord, the, the cost of our sin, what it cost you, what you've done for us, and that we would rem remember you and we would rejoice in you. And so, Lord, meet us here in this moment. And uh, we, if there's anyone, Lord, who hasn't received you, pray that today would be that day that they would see themselves for who they are, that they're sinners in need of salvation, and that they would receive salvation simply by coming to you or to find life. So God, go before us in this time, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go out there, live a fervent life so the people may know Jesus. We'll see you soon.